we now turn to different market structures, right? So we've talked about some of the foundational pieces in terms of where demand comes from. And we just went through some topics that established this connection between production, firms producing goods and services from their inputs, and the costs associated with those production. Now, once those goods are produced, firms are going to want to take them and sell them in a market. And so that's where we start thinking about the different types of environments that a business may be operating in, the different kinds of markets and their different structures um, that firms might be trying to sell in. We've got a couple of different examples, and so you can think about Amazon, think about what they are, who their competition is, and how they carry out their business. And we've also got, this is the name of a local pizza place in Edo, Ohio, right? And so you can think about, there are a couple of different of these local pizza shops in Ada. Do you have a preference between them, right? Um, think about who their competition is. Think about how big their market is footprint is. Think about um, how they try to make themselves seem different from who their competition is. That's different from GM, right? GM is much more of a national and global producer, right? But they face competition, but not that much competition, right? I mean, in terms of number of firms, right? And you could think about if one of their competitors tries to do something, does GM have to follow, right? Does GM have to also take that into consideration as they're pulling their things together? That's different from different kinds of agricultural production, right? Where um, do, is there much of a preference over one farmer's um, corn compared to another farmer's corn? Not so much, right? We've also got a story of, right, so this is the name of a, a generic manufacturer, a generic uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer, right? And so you can think about the, the story about generic pharmaceuticals versus those patent protected brand name drugs. Um, all of this, right? There's a lot of different market structures that we're going to focus on. Um, and so the first one that we want to talk about is a perfectly competitive market. So we start here as, as this is our initial starting place is thinking about what if we had an environment that was just perfect in terms of competition, mainly because of Adam Smith, right? Adam Smith was in love with markets and he talked very much about how markets were able to uh, produce some really great outcomes, right? And so if people had decentralized decision-making um, and were free to make their own choices in a free market scenario, that it could maximize some welfare outcomes. And so it was kind of the ideal that we compare everything against. But in reality, very, very few markets are going to fit the criteria of a perfectly competitive market. But it's still, it's a useful place to think about what what an optimal market would look like, and then we can consider if we're moving away from that 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 so-called perfectly competitive market, what are some of the implications of that, right? So this is our starting point. We start by any of these market structures by, by describing them with a set of assumptions about how they operate. Again, assumptions are not statements of fact, rather they're just hypothetical what if statements, right? So we can consider what if this were true? What would a world look like if this was true? And so we've got four main assumptions that we're going to consider in this class for a perfectly competitive market. Though I'll point out in my upper level health econ class, right, we actually look at seven different assumptions of a perfectly competitive market, right? So this is this is working on a little bit narrower framework than that. And so it puts a few things in the background, but these are probably four of the more important ones. And that's what we're going to focus on in this class. But realize if you look at um, some other sources online, um, you may see a, a slightly different number than this. And even your textbook uh, ignores one of the ones that I'm going to focus on. Number one, large number of buyers and sellers such that no one buyer or seller can influence price, right? And so we refer to this as sometimes the price taker assumption. It means that everybody has to take the price as given. We all take the price as given. We being both buyers and sellers in this market, right? So what this is really saying is that no buyer or seller has any ability to influence market prices. Sometimes it's useful to think about a specific market to kind of illustrate what this assumption means. So we can think about there are so many buyers. Are there many buyers in the market for gasoline? I would argue there are, right? We've got many, many buyers. And I'm going to argue that there's so many buyers that no single buyer can try to influence the price. Meaning, if you're a buyer and you look at the price of a gas, a gallon of gas, and it's advertised at $2.50, can you go into that gas station and say, I don't really like your prices. I think I'd like to pay $1.50. Could you get away with that as a buyer? 
Of course you can't. Why can they easily laugh you out of their out of their store? Because there's so many other buyers standing behind you that you as a single buyer are in no way in a negotiating position to get more favorable prices. Similarly, are there a lot of gas stations selling gas? Sure there are, right? And so again, we can think about our sellers in a position to try to negotiate for better prices, right? So if everyone's selling their gas at $2.50, can one gas station say, I don't really like that price. I think I'd like to earn $4 for my gallon of gas. Can they unilaterally raise their price up to $4 and get away with it? No, right? If they do that, Buyers know there's so many other sellers in the market that that one seller has absolutely no ability to negotiate for more favorable prices, right? So there's so much competition. There's so many other buyers, so many other sellers that no one is in a position to negotiate for more favorable, either lower or higher prices. That's our first assumption. Second assumption, homogenous product, or we assume another way to state this is there's no product differentiation. Right, so what product differentiation is, is when a producer has differentiated their product. We've got um, no product differentiation, sorry, differentiation. Product differentiation has two parts to it, right? So number one, consumers have to believe that there is a difference between goods, right? It doesn't matter whether that difference is real or not, but consumers have to believe that there's a difference, right? So two examples that, that I use, usually tell for that is, number one, with running shoes, right? So if, if anybody out there is a runner or an athlete, um, you, you can think about those name brand really nice shoes versus um, the generic athletic shoes. Is there a difference in the quality between those two? Of course there is, right? That's something where that difference that consumers believe, that's a real, real difference in those goods, right? But then we can also have, right, we told the story earlier about prescription drugs, right? You've got things like Claritin D that used to be on a brand name patent protected drug, but once that patent expires, then it means that all of these generics can try to jump into the market and compete. And so Walmart has their generic alternative and Target has their ge generic alternative and everybody has their generic alternative to, I think it's called Loritidine is, is the drug. Is there really any difference between brand name Claritin and those generics that, that Walmart's offering? Uh, if you actually ask the pharmacist, right, there is a difference between um, between a generic uh, and, and an original, and it has to do with some additional fillers and inactive ingredients and those things. But for the most part, right, there's some, uh, what is it, bioequivalence between the two. There's a range of bioequivalence that has to happen between the two in order for the federal drug, the, yeah, the FDA to, <laughs> to approve that. Um, but for the most part, yeah. They're, they're going to work the same with most consumers and so or with most patients right and so we can assume that there's not really any kind of a difference but product differentiation number one consumers have to believe that there's a difference and number two they have to be willing to put money down on that perceived difference so again back to those athletic shoes that are of a higher quality are consumers willing to pay more money for that higher quality yes they are right are consumers willing to pay more for a brand name drug they are, right? These things are still in this, and Claritin is still a higher priced drug in uh, in the, the drugstore, and people still buy it because of that perceived difference, right? The consumers perceive there's a difference, and they're willing to put money down on it. That's what product differentiation is. However, in a perfectly competitive market, there is no product differentiation. Another way to think about this is that consumers absolutely do not care whether they buy the good from producer A or producer B. So think about this for a second as a question. Is there product differentiation when it comes to gas? Are consumers willing to pay more money from gas from different gas stations? We also, in a perfectly competitive market, assume that there are no or low barriers to entry. Barriers to entry are simply those things that make a new entrant in a market more difficult to join, right? If somebody wants to, was on the sidelines, but is thinking about jumping in, how tough of a time are they going to have, right? And so you could think about, in, in a later topic, we're going to further explore this topic, but right now we're just going to assume, nah, there's not really very much that's going to prevent or make it difficult for a new entrant to join the market. And so you could, again, think about gas stations, right? Are there any hoops you'd have to jump through to, to open up a new gas station? There's a little bit of government regulation involved in that, right? Could you also get some financing together? Would it be difficult for you to get financing together to, to open up a, a gas station, 
right? Ah, right. All of those things go into whether or not there's barriers to entry um, that influence um, uh, a market. In a perfectly competitive market, anybody can just pretty easily jump into a market. So we have no or low barriers to entry. And then the last assumption that we have is perfect information. All decision makers have perfect information. But what it really means is that people are informed well enough so that they can correctly make rational decisions and identify changes in the system, right? So we've got, this really covers two different sides of the story. We've got the seller side of the story. We're assuming that sellers know what their cost of production is. They know what they're going to have to spend to buy goods and services. They know what they are to produce goods and services. They know what their competition looks like. They know what their competition's doing. They have a sense of uh, the impact of consumer demand and all of those kinds of things. On the consumer side, when we assume perfect information, we assume that that buyers understand how beneficial something's going to be. So they understand the impact on their utility and they make choices uh, accordingly. And so they can correctly evaluate the costs and the benefits and make rational decision making about it. And if anything changes in the system, everyone is informed about it in a very timely fashion. So for example, we can consider what if prices go up, right? If prices go up, buyers are very, very quickly, if not instantly going to know that. Right, and so th this this assumption about perfect information seems a little bit ridiculous um, when I when I give the long version of it, right? Because we've talked about all the different ways where rationality might break down throughout this uh, this these last few topics, right? But think about for gas stations for a second, right? If a gas station were to change their price, would buyers know about it pretty quickly? My goodness, right? They they actually put the 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 price out on their signs. All you have to do is drive by. There's very little cost associated with getting the information about changes in 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 the price of a good. But if you think about um, like a gallon of milk down at a local grocery store, are you going to know when that price goes up very quickly or very instantly? Probably not, right? And so for different goods, this this um, how much this assumption fits or does not fit um, is going to vary. We also want to assume, as a behavioral assumption, that firms are in the business of maximizing profit, right? They're, they are not trying to maximize revenue. They're not trying to minimize cost. Rather, they're trying to maximize profit. Profit, I'm going to use pi for profit here in microeconomics. It's just equal to the difference between total revenue and total cost. Whereas total revenue, we've talked about this a, a little while ago, right? Total revenue is simply price times quantity. It's the total amount of money that a firm brings in. Right. Whereas total cost, we discussed that during the cost uh, topic, right, where we were talking about the total amount of money or the total cost they incur, both the economic and the accounting cost that they incur to produce their goods. Profit is the difference between those two, and we assume that businesses are really going to behave in a way so that whatever they do that makes their profit go up, that's what they're going to want to pursue. Again, if you're an accounting major, you could think about some different terminology for the money coming into a firm and the money that they had to spend to produce their goods, right? Um, we're going to assume a model of uh, maximizing profit, but we want to point out that there are some other objectives that a firm might have, right? So I've got, this is supposed to be the picture of someone at a uh, shareholder meeting. Um, you know what a shareholder is, right? Somebody who owns stock in a company, they're a part owner of it. And you could think about uh, sometimes a shareholder or somebody who owns stock, they might get paid a dividend, right? A dividend, um, not all stocks pay them, but some do. Um, and so you could think about if a business has some extra money at the end of the year laying around, they have two basic choices with it, right? <clears throat> they might want to pay out some dividends to make their shareholders happy, or they might want to try to build a, a new factory with that money, right? And so you could think about um, if they're trying to make their shareholders happy, that might at some times come in conflict with some of their long term uh, with some some decisions that would be best in the best long term interests of the firm. And so again, right, sometimes that might be a little bit of a twisted, um, twisted motivation. We can also have so right next to it, I've got a bunch of individuals sitting at a table, and that's supposed to represent not shareholders, but stakeholders, right? So you remember the difference between stakeholders and uh, shareholders? Shareholders own shares. Uh, they own stock. They own part of a company. They could be sitting around this table, but this table really represents anybody else who's impacted by the decisions of a business. And so we might want to have the community 
uh, at the table. We might want to have labor rights groups, that kind of stuff, right? We might want to have the environment uh, represented at the table, right? A any Anyone who is impacted by the actions of the and consumers would also be there as well, right? It's, it's a much broader definition. You could think about a local hospital if they're thinking about what kind of, uh, what kind of expansion they want to do to their hospital, what kind of new wing do they want to add, boy, doing something like a cardiac cath might be something that generates a whole lot of revenue, but doing something with childhood cancer, maybe that might be something that they, they care about doing that may not necessarily make as much money, but might satisfy some needs of the community. And so again, right, you could think about firms in the real world might actually be trying to think about how to please their share, their stakeholders rather than just trying to minimize, maximize their own individual profit. And we, of course, have nonprofits, um, which are, by definition, um, not trying to maximize their profit, but rather they're trying to get no profit whatsoever, right? And again, we are, we are not, this is an illegal class, so we're not going to go too much into the definition of what uh, legal nonprofits are, but it definitely is um, a tax status, right? So we can talk through uh, a picture of some graphs in terms of what a firm would do if they wanted to maximize profit and they were operating in a perfectly competitive market. Some of this we've seen before. Some of this is going to be new. On the right, what do I have on the right? Up here, I've got a perfectly competitive market. Notice, what am I measuring on the axes? I'm measuring price vertically. I'm measuring quantity horizontally. So this downward sloping line, that's the demand. This upward sloping line, it's the supply. As a reminder, who does this demand represent? That's all consumers. That's everyone who wants to buy this product. Who does that supply represent? That's all of the firms that want to supply in this market. And again, how many buyers do we have? How many sellers do we have? Well, by assumption, we've got huge numbers on either side, right? We've got a large number of buyers represented by this demand curve, and we have a large number of producers who are represented by that supply curve. And each individual buyer and each individual seller is not important. They do not influence outcomes. And so it's the interaction of all of the buyers and all of the sellers together which determine what the price is in the market so that we have on a market level equilibrium. That is where the quantity demanded by all of the buyers is equal to the quantity supplied by all of the many different firms. That's a story that we've already told. Now on the left, we want to consider one firm, one single firm, and what they should do if they're operating in this market. So again, this one single firm on the left is one small guy in this much, much, much larger market. He, this one firm, has no ability to influence the market whatsoever. If he decides he wants to produce more or less, nobody notices, nobody cares. The only thing he can't do is raise his price, right? If he tries raising his price, nope, he'll lose all business. He also can't undercut the price because he would be swamped in the entire market, right? He has no ability to influence the price. He has to take whatever that price is as a given. What piece of information do we know about this firm so far on the left? MC, right? What does MC stand for? That's the marginal cost curve. And again, can you remind me, what does the marginal cost curve represent? Right? So again, this marginal cost curve tells us, unit by unit by unit by unit, what's the cost of each of these additional units? And the downward portion isn't so interesting, but when we get to this upward portion, that's where it's interesting for a firm, the upward portion of the marginal cost curve. We're halfway there, right? We've got information for this firm about their costs. Now we have to think about their benefits. And again, step back. Why would a firm produce a good? What, what do they get out of producing a good? They get the opportunity to sell it and generate some revenue. So revenue is really the clear story that, that, that we need to tell, or the missing piece from the story that we're telling. Again, recall, total revenue. I can find that by price times quantity. So let's assume, let's just go ahead and assume down here on this table that the price in the market is $60. Whatever this market is, we've uh, the market has determined, all the buyers and all the sellers together have determined that the price is $60. Can you figure out what the rest of this table is, right? So we could think about for the firm, if they don't sell anything at all, 
how much revenue are they going to bring in, right? If their quantity that they produce and sell for the market is zero, they're not going to bring in any revenue. If they sell one unit, what's the price they sell it for? Selling that one unit for $60 would bring in $60 of total revenue. If they were to sell two units, what would happen in the market, right? Selling two units at $60 a pop would bring in $120 of revenue and three units at $60 a pop, $180 of revenue. That's all well and fine, but what we really care about is marginal revenue. Marginal revenue, change in total revenue divided by the change in quantity, right? So again, undefined for the first unit, but as the firm sells the first unit, how much did their revenue go up by? It went up by 60. How about the second unit? How much did their revenue go up by? 60. How about the third unit? How much did their revenue increase by when they sold their third unit? 60. That's the big thing, right? For a firm in a perfectly competitive market, the marginal revenue is equal to whatever the price that the market determined. For a firm in a perfectly competitive market, for a firm that's operating in a perfectly competitive market, their marginal revenue is going to be constant and equal to whatever the market determined the price to be. Again, we can go back to these assumptions and say, why is that true, right? We can go back and say, why is that true? Because if we think about this, right, we've got so many buyers, everybody knows what the price is, and everything from every producer is identical. If this one producer ever tried to raise their price to try to get some kind of advantage, they wouldn't be able to get away with it, right? Because there's so many other producers everyone would instantly know that they were charging a higher price and because there's no brand loyalty to an individual producer they would lose all of their customers right and similarly what if they tried to lower their price if they tried to lower their price you might think that's a good idea but let's trace out the logic if they lowered their price by a penny below what the market is think about this everyone everyone would instantly know that right that's what the perfectly perfect information assumption does everyone would instantly know that this one producer who's selling identical things as everyone else is is selling at a price lower than that and what would happen they wouldn't just get more buyers they would get every single buyer in the market that won't work as long as you have an upward sloping marginal cost right because the cost of additional goods gets higher and higher and higher there's no way they'll ever be able to produce for the entire market and so we've just made an argument that they can't raise the price they can't lower the price they have to take the price as a given and so that means every single additional unit they ever produce they're always going to sell it at a price of P which means their marginal revenue is always always going to be that price how much their revenue increases by is always going to remain the same. So if I ask you to graph out marginal revenue on this curve, what would it look like? Right? Marginal revenue is a constant that's equal to whatever the price in the market is. So here's the way that I'm going to do it a little bit carefully, right? I can take this price in the market and if I just bring it over at a perfectly flat line in a perfectly competitive market, the marginal revenue is equal to the price in the market. That's marginal revenue. One more thing to do. We've said since early on in this class, rational decision making, you should be thinking on the margins, right? So question, can you explain what's similar and what's different about marginal revenue and marginal cost? So let's go ahead and think first in red marginal cost right marginal cost tells me this is the cost of the first unit this is the cost of the second the third the fourth the fifth the sixth the seventh the eighth the ninth the tenth the eleventh the twelfth and the thirteenth right the marginal cost curve tells me unit by unit by unit the cost of each of those additional units remember rationally we need to think about two sides of a decision the benefits and the cost the marginal cost curve tells me half the story tells me the cost of producing these additional units so we can ask rationally does it make sense for this firm to produce that first unit we already know what the cost is and now what we just 
added was the benefit, right? The benefit of producing something is that you can sell it for revenue. In blue, marginal revenue, that's how much extra revenue that first unit is going to bring in. Is it rational for the firm to make and produce that first unit? Sure it is, right? Why? Because the gap between those two is how much profit they earn on that first unit. Rationally, do they want to produce it? Yes, because the benefits are greater than the cost. Move on to the next unit, right? That's what mar uh, marginal thinking does. It says move on to the next, and we see the cost, we see the benefits, and there's some gains. And how about that third unit? There's the benefit, way outpaces the costs. How about this one, right? At this fourth unit, those are the ben benefits, these are the gains. Is that where the firm wants to stop producing? Is that where they maximize their profit? No, think about the unit right next to it. Now, at this point, the next unit, costs are going up, right? And so there's benefits, we got the cost, and the difference is the gain. The green was the extra money they were making on that, what is that, the fifth good. It's smaller than the fourth good, but it's still adding to their pile of profit, right? And so they'd want to produce the sixth and the seventh and the eighth. And that ninth unit, think about that ninth unit, right? They're not adding very much profit, but it's still going up, right? As long as their profit is going up, continue expanding output. How about at this very last unit, this tenth unit? What do we see? Oops, supposed to be in blue, right? The benefit in blue there is no there is no extra profit on that last one right could 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 the firm keep expanding production if they tried to produce the 11th 12th and 13th unit could they produce that 13th unit they could right but the amount of revenue that they generate from that third unit would not cover the extra cost of production they'd be in a bit of a hole right? Where would they have to come up with this money to pay for those extra costs to produce that 13th unit? They'd have to dip in to their profits and their profits would get smaller, right? Here we go. Here's the, the final decision rule. For firms, and not just in a perfectly competitive market, but for any firm that's rationally trying to maximize their profit, they should continue producing up to the point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. That is important. You should put seven or eight different stars by it because it's an important concept, right? If we think rationally and in a marginal way, unit by unit, firms producing additional units and whether the benefits outweigh the costs, they should keep expanding production until the marginal revenue is equal to the marginal cost. This should also be the way that you live your life, right? If you think about studying for an exam next week, right? What are you going to get out of that time that you spend studying for the exam? Hopefully, it's going to have a boost to your grade. Is it worth it? Think about the boost to your grade, but also think about the cost, right? If you have to give up two hours of studying, is that marginal revenue, that marginal benefit going to be worth the marginal cost? Think about how much you should study. Is it infinity? No, certainly not, right? But there's a certain point where the benefits are still being justified by the cost and you should keep studying, but not beyond that point, right? Maximize, for a firm, they maximize their profit where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. We can tell this story in a couple of different pictures, right? So what I've got up top is I've got, again, to a uh, marginal cost curve, marginal cost curve. And if I just add to this a marginal revenue, and it's a little bit low, so I could try to push that marginal cost curve up a little bit. No, it's not letting me. If I could try to adjust it, there we go, right? If, 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 this is the marginal revenue curve for these two graphs up top, the one on the left and the one on the right. Notice that I'm making the argument that where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. That's the quantity the firm should produce to maximize profit. Ooh, I didn't put that on the last graph, but let's uh, identify that point where they intersect. Let's identify that as Q pi. That's gonna be the notation that I use to designate the quantity this firm should produce to maximize profit, Q pi. So again, on the right, where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, that's the quantity the firm should produce to maximize profit. I can tell this story about profit maximization in two other ways, right? So down below, 
I've got the, a construction that's mathematically equivalent to up above, but it's just a slightly uh, different version of the equations, right? Instead of looking at marginal revenue, I'm looking at TR, total revenue, right? But think about what the total revenue equation would look like, right? Remember, total revenue was just price times quantity. If prices are constant, then this is just a straight line, right? It's just a constant straight line that starts at the origin, and the slope of the total revenue is equal to whatever the price in the market is, right? It's a straight line. How about the cost curve, though, right? Remember, total cost, the marginal cost is the slope of the total cost. So if this is the slope of the total cost curve, make sure in the, your mind that those those match up, right? Notice what do we have for the marginal cost curve? It's positive, but getting smaller. What do we have down here with the slope? It's positive, but getting smaller. It's getting flatter and flatter and flatter, and then eventually it stays positive and starts going up. The slope stays positive and starts increasing. Right, this the positive slope starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Remember, what's the point of profit? Profit is the difference between total revenue and total cost. So you could think about if you looked for any level of output, the distance between total revenue and total cost, I'm gonna assert that actually the point where marginal or where total revenue and total costs where their difference is the largest the point where they're trying to maximize their profit, it's absolutely consistent with what we had earlier, right? And in fact, if you're an engineer and you think about this, taking derivatives and optimization, marginal revenue is the derivative of total revenue, marginal cost is the derivative of the cost function, so it's not surprisingly that they're equal to each other if you're doing the optimization problem, right? For those of us who aren't engineers, this is just a nice little picture. There's one other thing I wanna show out about this picture. This point right here. Can you describe what that point represents? We can tell a similar story, but a little bit different, to the right. Notice, what am I looking at on the right? Instead of looking at total revenue and total cost, instead, I'm looking at the profit function. So what this function on the right shows is the difference between the total revenue and total cost function. And notice, where is the profit function at its highest point? Profit is at its highest point at the same quantity that we found where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. I like this story about marginal revenue, marginal cost, because I think it's got some nice, in, nice intuition that backs up what we've said about thinking marginally and thinking rationally. But really, right, if we wanted to think more broadly mathematically about some optimization, it's all consistent with each other, right? We can talk about how things change in the market, right? So let's assume that we've again got a market on the right. I've got demand, which is all the buyers. I've got supply, which is all of the sellers. And then on the left, I've got one single firm in that market. And this marginal cost is their cost of production. And they take the price as a given. And so this is their marginal revenue. And given that this is their marginal revenue, they are going to keep producing right up to this point where they maximize profit. I want to consider a change in the market. What if this is the market for tomatoes? And what if it find, we find out that tomatoes um, reduce your chance of cancer? Is that going to really influence the supply curve? Remember that the supply curve is telling about sellers, what their cost of production is, and their, the, their ability to bring goods to the market, right? Think about what a farmer needs to, to bring some tomatoes to market, right? They've got to pay for some land, labor, and capital. Are any of those things influenced by the probability that um, tomatoes help reduce the, the odds of cancer? No, right? They're not. How about the demand for tomatoes? Sure, right? As consumers, right, if that reduced the probability of getting cancer, great. There's going to be this increase in the demand for tomatoes. So we can show an increase in the demand for tomatoes. What is that going to do, right? If prices did not adjust, we'd have what? Is that a market shortage or market surplus, right? That would have a market shortage, which would put upward pressure on prices eventually, eventually, right? Prices in this market are going to go up. Let's do it in blue, though. Prices in this market are going to go up. So then when prices in the market go up, how are how does, how is this firm impacted, right? You can try to move that up just a little bit, right? So when prices in the market go up, what's that going to do? That's going to push up the marginal revenue. Now think about this for a second, right? These units right here, 
before prices went up, why weren't those units produced, right? Those units weren't produced because the cost just wasn't, it wasn't covering, it wasn't covered by the revenue that would be generated, right? The revenue just simply wasn't enough to produce these additional units. But now, if there's been a change in the market and it's put upward pressure on prices, suddenly these units that used to be not rational, suddenly the benefits of uh, producing them and bringing them to market are going to cover these higher costs of production. And so this firm is going to decide to do what? Not surprisingly, this firm is going to decide to produce some additional units. There we go, right? We've got when there's an increase in the demand for a product, it's going to put upward pressure on prices. And that upward pressure on prices means that existing firms are going to start ramping up production. But notice, how about the next few units, right? Beyond that, these next few units, nope. They're going to increase production, but not infinity. There's certain units that still just aren't going to be economically feasible to produce. But we can do another thing. What if they cure cancer and they cure diabetes, right? Then there might be an even bigger increase in the demand. And so if there's an even bigger increase in demand, prices are going to go up even further. And when prices go up even further, how is the one firm imp impacted prices go up which is going to shift up the marginal revenue curve which means these units that used to be just not rational to produce now yep the firm is going to want to produce them i want to step back and tell the big picture of this story right what we just looked at is we just looked at changes in demand that raised prices and for those different prices it changed the marginal revenue and we know that firms want to maximize pre maximize profit where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. That identifies the quantity the firm should produce to maximize profit. Step back, what did we do? We looked at different prices from the market and where those prices hit the marginal cost curve, it told us the quantity the firm should produce to maximize profit. Let me turn that on its head and say it one last time. This amazing marginal cost curve right here this amazing marginal cost curve tells us for different levels of price what's the quantity the firm should produce do we have any other curves that we've ever described in this class that show a curve that shows for different prices how many units should be produced isn't that sound exactly like this supply curve it does in fact the marginal cost curve is the supply curve it's the supply curve for the firm. I always think of this as the uh, the empire moment, right? When the, the marginal cost curve, it is the supply curve, right? So in general, right, think about all the great intuition that we have from this, right? Suddenly now, when we were talking about that supply curve earlier, whether it was steep or flat was, was a matter of elasticity, right? But we also said that we know something about whether the marginal cost curve is steep or flat. That has to do with how quickly marginal productivity changes, right? So there is absolutely this underlying relationship between uh, productivity and elasticity, right? It's just way in the background, but this is the piece that connects production and elasticity. This marginal cost curve, it shows for different prices what's the quantity the firm should produce to maximize profit. There are a couple of um, extra iterations that we want to do, a couple of variations on this thing. So the number one most important cost curve is the marginal cost curve. The second most important cost curve is the average total cost curve. I want to do this one entirely by freehand, so please follow along, um, right? We've got on the right, let's put a market. And in our market, let's have the demand and the supply. And the demand and supply determine what the price in the market should be, which the firm in a competitive environment yep, back to black, takes whatever that takes whatever that price is as a given and that's their marginal revenue so now on the left I'm gonna try to slow down a bit and graph this out we've got the quantity notice what's the difference between this quantity on the right and this quantity on the left I don't do it but some other sources 
they'll use a lowercase q on this left-hand graph to try to reinforce that, that difference between the two, right? So we're measuring money vertically, quantity horizontally, right? Um, but again, this is the firm on the left, right? And so we've got, all right, so if that straight line represents P equals MR, P equals MR, if I've got a U-shaped marginal cost curve, then I know this is the quantity the firm's going to produce to maximize profit. But now what I want to add to this is the average total cost curve. Do you recall what how I need to draw the average total cost curve? It needs to be a U-shaped cost curve who hits its minimum at the where it intersects with the marginal cost curve. So what I'm going to do, an easy way to do this is pick a point on marginal cost, come up from it. And that nice, beautiful U-shaped cost curve is the average total cost curve. And again, as a quick question, can you again explain the difference between the marginal cost and the average total cost? So now I'm going to try to be really careful with my graph, right? So if I take this quantity and I go up to this value, this is measuring three different pieces of information. At this quantity, if I go up, if I go up, it's measuring the value of marginal cost, right? Because it's on the marginal cost line. It's also, if I take this quantity up to the marginal revenue curve, measuring the value of marginal revenue. And I know that for a firm in a competitive market, marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So one thing that I can that I can highlight is that in a competitive market, in a perfectly competitive market, prices are equal to MR, which are equal to MC when the firm maximizes profit. Those three values are all equal to each other, right? But sometimes it's more useful to use one rather than the other. The other thing I want to do is I just added the average total cost curve. So if I take this quantity up to the average total cost curve, right? If I take it up to the average total cost curve, then what I'm measuring vertically right here is the value of average total cost. And the reason I want to do that is because I want to shade in this area right here. And you know what shape that is, right? That is a rectangle. You know how to do the area. And specifically, I want to think about this is an area that I'm shading in that is between P star, right? So I said that the top of this, it's going to be all three of those values. But for a reason that's going to come obvious in a second, I want to think about this as being the price. It is the price. It's also the marginal revenue. It's also the marginal cost. But it is the top of this rectangle is the price. The bottom is ATC. So it's the area between price and ATC that covers the quantity the firm should produce. So let's do a little bit of, oh boy, what is that? Uh, geometry? <laughs> How do you calculate the area of a rectangle? It's base times height. The base of this thing is Q. And the height, we just said, it's P minus ATC. That's the area. But I can expand this out algebraically, and I could say Q times P minus Q times ATC. But actually, P times Q, that's the same thing as total revenue, isn't it? And if you recall, ATC is total cost divided by quantity. If I take quantity times average total cost, I'm getting total cost. That area in blue is profit, right? That area in blue measures profitability how profitable a single firm is in the market. So again, right? Number one, most important cost curve is the marginal cost curve. Why is it most important? Because number one, it answers behaviorally the number one most important firm question for the firm. What should they do? Well, what can they do? They can't do anything in terms of price. The only thing this firm can do is adjust the amount that they produce. How much should they produce? They need the marginal cost curve to answer that question. The second most important question is, how are they doing, right? In order to know how they're doing, we need to look at the average total cost curve because it's what we use to identify how much profit there is in the market, right? Third, in order to look at this third piece of the story, I'm going to again do this by hand. And I'm doing it by hand in part because I think it's a little bit more useful to do it that way. But also I can do things a little bit more dramatically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have demand fall a lot, right? This is my demand curve. 
This is my supply curve, and so we've got prices have fallen a whole lot. Prices fall a whole lot. It's possible. I'm trying to do this as a straight line to keep things somewhat organized. We've got P equals MR, and again, this is the quantity of a firm. Right, their marginal cost is right here. So this is the quantity the firm produces to maximize profit. Now, when I add average total cost, I'm going to add it a special place. I'm going to say that what if we have average total cost that's all up here. Again, can we shade in that area that we just talked about, right? I could probably do that with this guy, right? So if, if, if we try to shade in the area between, I take my quantity and I go to the average total cost, this little guy right here, right, at this quantity, if I take the quantity up to this curve, this is the average total cost. If I take this quantity and I go up to where MR equals MC, it's P equals MR equals MC. And so now, hey, I can shade this in, and this still looks like a rectangle. Can I still calculate the area of this rectangle? Sure I could, right? I could do the one half, uh, not one half, but I could do the base times height, and I could get an area of that rectangle. But what do you notice, right? How does P compare to the average total cost in this? Now I've got price at the bottom and ATC at the top in words. What does this mean? And we can think about how this situation is different from this situation when prices were greater than the average total cost, right? That firm, when we shaded in that area, that was the profit that they were earning. Now this firm, what are they doing? They're losing money. That area that we calculate would, it would still be a positive number, but it would represent the amount of loss that they have. You know what, though? How much should a firm produce if they were going to lose money? It ends up being the same answer as before. If a firm cannot earn any money, but they so they definitely will have a loss, but they want to minimize their losses, they still should be producing at a point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Any other combination of marginal uh, of quantity, um, other than where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, would produce a level of loss that's greater than what we just shaded in. So it's still the same decision rule, but now what we have is this firm is losing money. So what do they do when they lose money, right? If a firm's losing money, they basically have two options, right? And we're thinking about this as a short-term, uh, a short-term decision. In the short run, if they're losing money, what could they do? They could decide to put up a closed sign and just try to keep their business closed for a few days, so they don't have to pay their labor and they don't have to pay some of their costs, and just hope that things get better, right? Or alternatively, they could just shutter permanently and go out of business, right? We can think about those two different alternatives, um, and that represents the third curve that we need to add to our story. So when should a firm shut down? Number one most important question, what should a firm produce or how much should a firm produce? Marginal cost answers that. Number two, how is a firm doing? We need average total cost to do that and when average total cost is greater than price, a firm is losing money. And our th number three question is when should a firm, when they're losing money, decide to shut down. To add this, we need to, uh, to answer this question, we need to add, layer on one additional co uh, cost curve. So I'm going to go ahead and do this, again, a little bit more dramatically. We've got quantity, price, and let's assume that we've got a demand and we've got, oops, and a supply. A demand and a supply and a price. And I hope it's not too repetitive to have this in a video, but I think it's important be able to do it. This move it out of the way. I thought I was going to move that all over. Move it out of the way, right? And we've got again. We got to add a few pieces to this, right? So I've got a marginal cost curve here. So this is the quantity the firm should produce to maximize profit. Let's add an average total cost curve here, so that we know this firm is losing money because the average total cost is greater than P. MR and MC. But now the third curve I want to add to this is the average variable cost. Remember what the average variable cost looks like? Average variable cost is also a U-shaped cost curve, but it's located below the average total cost curve. Now I know in the long run the AVC is going to get closer and closer to the ATC, but I'm going to draw this a little bit dramatically where that's not the big big part of the picture. Instead, let's do this. A V, 
C. Maybe it looks like they're getting a little bit closer to each other. So now what can we do? We can do the same thing that we had before where if, if, if I take this quantity up to the average variable cost curve, what I'm measuring vertically is, right, I took it up to the cost curve and this was A, V, C. Now I can ask the question, how do price and A, V, C compare? In this scenario, AVC is right here, price is right here. If your prices are still greater than your AVC, do not shut down. If prices are still covering your AVC, don't shut down yet. A firm should only shut down if, 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 um, yeah, if demand fell even further so that it couldn't even cover the uh, average variable cost of production any lo longer that's when a firm should finally shut down. So before we get to another uh, another way to interpret what the, the intuition of this looks like, think about GM, right? It, it, if you're thinking about GM, think about what they have to pay to produce their cars. What are some of the things that they have to spend money on if they want to produce some of their cars? Those kinds of things are the average variable cost, right? Think about the things that they'd have to spend money on that are unrelated to their car production, right? One of the big problems that these uh, auto manufacturers got into uh, before the Great Recession was these things called legacy costs, right? Where they had a bunch of union workers that had worked for them for a very, very long time, uh, generated all these benefits, uh, union benefits, and then they retired and they would keep collecting all these benefits and the car companies had to keep paying them, right? So I'm oversimplifying the story, obviously. but. Think about those payment to retired union workers. Is that part of the fixed cost or the variable cost of GM's operations, right? Can you think of any other examples of variable or fixed costs as it relates to car production? And again, I, I point that out because that's what's relevant for us, right? What's relevant for us is if the price of automobiles can't even cover the average variable cost, those firms should be shutting down. But as long as they can pay their variable cost, it's okay for them to lose money in the short run, right? And in fact, right, what what happened to the auto manufacturer, right? It changed. It's coming back a whole lot better than it was um, a whole decade ago, right? But their prices, right? They were still covering the average variable cost of, of, of producing a car. It was just they had all these fixed costs, all these legacy costs that meant that they were losing a lot of money per car, right? But as long as they were still able to cover their variable costs, shouldn't be going out of business. That's at least this what this simple, simple model uh, of a uh, perfectly competitive market looks like. Okay, so I want to introduce one extra version of this story for how we think about this. So again, what we highlighted earlier in blue was when a firm was losing money, right? I went from my price up to my average total cost, that that area in blue is the level of their negative profit. But now what we just layered on top of it was the average variable cost, right? If I look at the difference between the average variable cost and the average total cost, do you remember what that is? That's the average fixed cost. So if I take the average fixed cost and I multiply it by the quantity that's produced, in green, those are the level of fixed costs. So again, I, I pointed to this earlier decision that a firm has. In the short run, if they find themselves in a position where they're losing money. What should they do? Continue operating? If they continue operating, this is how many units they should produce, and they're going to lose the amount in blue. Alternatively, what could they do is they could put up a closed sign for a while, right? They could shut down operations so that they don't have to pay for all those variable costs. But in the short run, they still have to pay their fixed cost. And if they have no revenue coming in because they've shuttered their doors, if they've shut down, that fixed cost represents the value of their losses from closing down. Either way, this firm's losing money. But which of those scenarios loses less money? As long as prices are covering your average variable cost, your losses in blue from continued operation are going to outpace your losses in green of fixed cost shuttering your door losses.
Yep, it's a slightly different presentation. Again, not a big deal. I, I think the, the price comparison is probably the easiest to remember, but conceptually, um, maybe maybe that graph might might click with your the way that you're thinking about this a little bit differently. There's one last thing that we want to consider, and that's um, one of uh, the other assumptions that we considered earlier, that one about uh, barriers to entry and about anybody being able to jump in or jump out, right? We can talk about what would that look like? So I've, again, got a nice little firm here. Um, where I've got on the right, I've got a market, and I've got on the left a firm with a marginal cost and an average total cost. And it looks like that blue line, price equals marginal revenue. So this is the quantity the firm should produce to maximize profit. And if I shade in this area, oops, I'm shading this area in in blue usually is what I have been doing, right? So I'll try to be consistent and do that. That is the amount of profit in a business. But step back, Adam Smith says that in the long run, right, um, firms are going to use profitability as a signal of market opportunity, right? So if you recall a number of topics ago when we talked about producers and how they set their prices, Adam Smith said that producers use their inventories um, as a way to gauge whether their prices are too high or too low, right? If you see your inventory start building up, that's a signal to you from the market that you need to cut your prices. Similarly, if firms look around and they see an industry where, where firms are generating profit, that can be a signal that more people need to jump into this market, right? Jump off of the sidelines and into this market. But let's trace out for a second what would happen, right? If there's profit, if there's positive profit in an industry, that's a signal for more firms to join this industry. But when we have positive profit, and firms join the industry, that's going to increase the supply, which will do what? I'm going to try to make this a different color, right? Um, when more firms jump into the industry and increase supply, it's going to put downward pressure on prices. And once prices start to fall, we'll try to trace this out and make not make it too messy, existing firms in the market, they're not going to want to produce as much. And if you can see in red what's happened to their profit, it got smaller, right? So that was the string of logic, right? If there's profitability in an industry, that's a signal for more firms to join the market, which should increase the supply. If there's positive profits, we should see more supply, which would put downward pressure on prices, which would decrease existing profitability and you could think about right um, when uh, when the new products come out for for different industries right and when um, God the classic example is the whole the iPhone thing right or the, the music things right the I, I iTunes not iTunes gosh what was that called iPods I couldn't remember the name of iPods when iPods first came out right this big big revolution in the way that music came right it really really popped huge amount of profits for Apple right so what happened other people try to jump in that market and try to repeat it, right? But what that did is that increased competition put some downward pressure on prices, right? Not a whole lot, but it did some downward pressure on prices. And some of those lower prices, because of those alternatives, cut into Apple's profits, not that much, right? But but a little bit. And you could think about how, how this process about uh, profitability being a signal that shapes people's decision to either enter or leave a market, right? We've also got... This is the story of what we have when we have positive profitability. But you can also think about if we look around and there's a bunch of firms that are losing money, that might be a signal for firms to leave the market. And if firms start leaving the market, who are going to be the first firms to leave the market? If I've got two different firms, one with a marginal cost like this and one with a marginal cost like this, which of those two firms is going to be most likely the first to leave the market? this higher cost firm, he's going to be most likely the first one to leave the market. I like that in the long run, right? And Adam Smith likes that in the long run because we end up with a lower cost of production when these competitive forces drive out higher cost operators, right? At least that's what this basic story about competition tells us. We can talk about where it might fall short in a little bit. The very last thing I want to say about this in the very long run. Do you remember, we just talked through the story and we did this graph where there was profit, it got more people in the industry, and it 
crunched out some of the profit. But notice I, I was still doing some profitability in this. In the long run, that process would have continued until we get to this point right here. This point right here that I'm emphasizing is the point where marginal cost and average total cost intersect. That intersection point of marginal cost and average total cost is the point where average total cost is at a minimum. And that is when people would stop entering the market, right? We only had the supply increasing and prices decreasing a little bit, and there was still some residual profit. But hey, more firms would have kept adding to the market. This process would continue with more and more firms joining the market until in the long run, supply has increased so much that prices are at the minimum of the average total cost curve. So we could say in the long run, in a perfectly competitive market, prices are equal to the marginal revenue, which are equal to the marginal cost because they're maximizing profit, which are equal to the minimum of the average total cost curve.